<clears throat> student FAQs and how to answer them. These are some of the most common questions we've received on this subject from students. Didn't we win the war, conquer Indigenous peoples? No, we didn't. There was no single moment or battle that has shaped the course of Indigenous and settler relationships in this place that we call Canada. Keep in mind that contact and colonialism occurred over the course of more than five centuries, with some Inuit communities not contacted by settlers until the 1920s. It's impossible to generalize across such vast distances and times. It would be more accurate to say that starting in the late 18th century, the British and later Canadian governments embark on the mission to assimilate and eliminate Indigenous peoples by whatever means necessary. It is, oh, sorry, be it force, forcible enfranchisement, starvation, or genocide. While these efforts have been devastating on Indigenous peoples, the process has always been partial and incomplete. Indigenous peoples have always fought against the resistance, these pressures, and continue to do so this way, this way, to this day. Oh, next question. Didn't the British ca Canadian government purchase this land from Indigenous peoples? Nope. Again, it's impossible to generalize in this case due to the vast geographic and temporal ranges. When individuals talk about purchasing land, they are often referring to the treaty process. But this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the treaty process actually in, in, involved. The first thing to keep in mind is that settlers and Indigenous peoples have two different attitudes regarding the meaning of treaties. Settlers believe that the land can be owned and subdivided into parcels. They did not recognize that Indigenous peoples held title to the land, but in order to prevent any problems down the road, they wanted Indigenous peoples to surrender any claims to the land in return for gifts or annual payments. Indigenous peoples believe that no one can own the land because it is divinely created in their eyes, treaties confirmed that they held the land as stewards for future generations. They sought to secure and protect land for the future while allowing some settlers to live alongside them. Thus, treaties were intended to as pacts of friendship, peace, and mutual support, not the abandonment of their rights and interests. For example, in Eastern Canada, Indigenous peoples and settlers, first the French, then the British, signed several agreements outlining how they could share the land. One of the most famous of these agreements is the Turo Wampum, which visually depicts two boats going down a stream side by side, never intersecting. One boat represents Indigenous peoples, while the other represents settlers. Each group governed themselves and shared the land on the basis of friendship and respect. The situation is more complex elsewhere in Canada. Much of Ontario, the prairies and parts of Northern Canada, as well as much of Vancouver Island are now covered by treaties signed between indigenous communities and settler governments throughout the 19th century and early 20th centuries, none of it being an exception, many indigenous communities were forced into signing these treaties in order to receive assistance and protection since their way of life was being systemically destroyed by the Canadian government. What's more, while indigenous peoples entered into these agreements in good faith, Representatives from Canadian government did not. They routinely broke promises that they made since their main objective was to open these lands for more settlers. 
it is important. Oh, oh yeah, okay. It is important to remember as well that many parts of Canada, including most of BC, are not covered by treaties or land sharing agreements. Settlers living in these areas are by their own laws, illegal squatters. However, many indigenous communities and the provincial and federal governments are in the process of negotiating treaties to cover these areas. Whew. That's a lot. That's a mouthful of information. The next question. Excuse me. Can't Indigenous peoples just make stuff up in their oral histories to get what they want? The short answer is no. This is an attitude based both on fundamental misunderstanding of Indigenous oral tradition as well as how primary sources work. First of all, most Indigenous communities in this place we now call Canada record their histories orally in some communities, certain individuals will be tasked with remembering these histories and ensuring that they are passed on accurately to future generations. These are not stories that are told for entertainment purposes, but rather to record and transmit important information that is uh, vital for the continued survival of Indigenous communities. The idea that someone would just make something up to get what they want is a violation that is sacred that is sacred trust what's more <clears throat> as archaeologists uh, archaeolog archaeologists archaeologists i can't even say that word historians and other scholars have begun working with indigenous peoples particularly with elders and knowledge keepers They've discovered that Indigenous oral traditions line up exactly with both historical accounts as well as scientific evidence of past environmental events. There are numerous examples of the Franklin expedition being only one of the most recent. Second, some individuals believe that written texts are inherently more trustworthy than oral histories, but this is not correct. The information that a person records is shaped not only by their wor worldview, but also the message they are trying to send. Who the in who the intended part or recipients are, and a whole host of other factors. For instance, if you were writing a report to your boss, you actually want to depict events in a flattering light but this might not actually ref reflect reality. Next question. <clears throat> Aren't we all immigrants, including Indigenous people? <sighs> no. Indigenous oral traditions tradition records that Indigenous peoples have been here since time immemorial. What this means is that Indigenous peoples have lived in North America or for so long that the exact number of years is irrelevant. While there are settlers alive today whose ancestors came to North America 500 years ago, this isn't really comparable to the fact that Indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and died on this continent for tens of thousands of years. Many people who bring up this question also talk about the Bering Land, Bering Land Strait theory. There is currently no historical or scientific consensus on how or when Indigenous people came to Mer North America, although we are definitely sure that Europeans didn't arrive first. As many scholars have noted, the debate on when Indigenous peoples came, as well as announcements of new discoveries about ancient archaeological sites, are inherently problematic because they privilege scientific information over Indigenous ways of knowing. As one scholar put it, we've always been here, should be good enough. Next question. 
What is the relationship of other oppressed ra racialized people to settler colonialism? For example, what about Chinese people who were targeted by discriminatory and racist laws? Strictly speaking, all peoples who are not indigenous fall under the category of settler, but the reality is a lot more complicated. In Canada, it is English-speaking white people who hold institutional power. That means that those of us who are white and English-speaking benefit from racism and are protected from feeling its effects. Black peoples and people of color don't hold the institutional power that whiteness con <clears throat> confers to white people. The ancestors of many of these individuals came to Canada against their will, such as African slaves. As a result, their relationship to indigenous people in Canada is different than what we're describing here. Others came to Canada as refugees, feeling oppression in their homelands. Each of these peoples have their own distinct histories and relationship with indigenous peoples and further settler colonialism and anti-blackness are entwined historically and contemporary social structures. Some scholars in these areas argue that black people and people of color should still be considered settlers because they do not benefit from settler colonialism, albeit not to the same extent as white settlers. However, other scholars argue that this the designation ignores the com complicated histories of black peoples and the people of color and the fact that settler societies like Canada are deeply racist and unfairly assigned blame to people who did not come to North, Agar North America by choice. However, as two white women, we are neither qualified nor in a position to make a judgment call here. Okay, the next part is do more. Decolonizing your syllabus. Ooh, this is interesting. Um, I think it's important that we read this even though we're not reading as an education system. Uh, talking about settler colonialism is a good place to start, but we would also encourage you to go further by rethinking how and what you teach more generally. This subject is deserving of its own blog post, but here are some suggestions to get you started. Decenter the historical experience of settlers. Break away from that more traditional historical narrative. Andrea likes to start her pre-Confederation surveys, for example, by talking about Ameri the American world system around the year 1000 CE. I don't even know what that means. Similarly, integrate Indigenous histories throughout your course, no matter what your topic is. Make Indigenous peoples the center. Emphasize Indigenous agencies, resistance, and activism when possible. Talk about the historical narratives that reinforce settler colonialism in the presence. Use reading by Indigenous authors and show films with Indigenous directors, writers, and actors. Take the UBC MOOC on reconciliations through Indigenous education. Not only is it free, but you can complete it in your own space.